Hey everybody, this is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study, and I want to continue in our series on End Times 101 or an Eschatology 101. Uh, essentially, we've been looking at a lot of the foundational kind of understanding that needs to be there before we can really get into the end times, because there are a lot of presuppositions that we have to go through, and there are a lot of biases that people bring into their study on the end times. And so we've been looking at a lot of things that kind of touch the end, but we haven't really been focusing on the end. With this video, we are now beginning our study on the end times. Like this is going to start the 70th week of Daniel. With, with Daniel, you have uh, chapter 2 has a, a prophecy that's given to King Nebuchadnezzar. It's a dream, and Daniel gives the interpretation of that dream. You have in Daniel... Chapter 7, 8, 9, you have more prophecies. These are visions. And then in chapter 9, there's an angel that comes to Daniel when he's praying and tells Daniel there's going to be these 70 weeks, which are seven prophetic years, if you will. And he divides that um, 70 weeks into three pieces and says, after seven weeks, this is going to happen. After 62 weeks from that seven, so after 69 weeks, this is going to happen. And then the 70th week, we find is, is somewhat different than the first 69 weeks, and we're going to look into that. But you have in the book of Daniel, chapters 11 and 12, more prophecies as well. Chapter 10 is kind of a weird one where it's sandwiched. It's, you have these prophecies in, in Daniel 7, 8, and 9. You get to chapter 10, it's another story, kind of like with chapter 9, where it begins with uh, Daniel praying. And in, in chapter 10, you have a vision that Daniel sees, and there's this conflict where the angel Gabriel is talking to Daniel and telling him about these principalities and powers over the the area that have been restraining him. But there's not really any prophetic material in Daniel chapter 10 in regards specifically to the end times, even if, if we can find parallels or even if we can find statements. Um, what, what I want to look at is what we call the tribulation. Daniel's 70th week is the tribulation period. Now, some people are going to call it the Great Tribulation and not just the Tribulation. This is the last period of time before Jesus returns. When we look at the idea of tribulation, in the Bible we're told that tribulation is what the world does to the people of God. Now, there's there's this idea out there uh, it's, it, it's heralded by both pre-trib and post-trib, um, those who believe that Jesus will return before the tribulation and take his church, herald this idea, as well as those who say, no, 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 Jesus only returns once at the very end of the tribulation, and that's the, the rapture of the church. It doesn't matter where you fall on the spectrum. There are a lot of people who do believe that tribulation, that seven-year period, is when God is pouring out his wrath. I don't believe that. I think that the tribulation consistently refers to uh, the way that the world treats God's people. So you're told in the Bible, blessed are you when they revile, persecute, and slander you, because that is how they treated the prophets that came before you. This is Matthew 5.11. Uh, Jesus also told his disciples quite explicitly in John 15.18-27 that they will face persecution and hardship. Tribulation is something that we're told we're going to face. It's not something that we should expect to be delivered from. So, but I, I agree with, with those who, who would say the final seven years, that great tribulation, as some would call it, that is different than tribulation we face in this world. I agree with that. But I don't agree with the next statement that the, um, the tribulation is somehow now God instead of the, the world. I think that that's a misunderstanding. While persecution is expected by the biblical authors, it is not necessary, and it certainly is not the standard. I don't want to, essentially, I don't want to put this out here and say, if we're not being persecuted, then we're doing something wrong. I think that the apostles and the prophets would rejoice if they found out that there was a, a world in which have, has been made that there was such an impact through the apostles on the Western world. That Christianity is not something that is so hated and so vehemently opposed that there's violence in the streets. Unlike with what they had to deal with under Rome's oppression, Christianity in our modern Western world is not, it's not 
uh, opposed in that sort of way, where we are fearing for our lives and living in the underground. While that might be true in the Middle East, and in certain parts of like Asia and other places around the world, it's not true in the West. And I think that the apostles and prophets would rejoice at, at such a blessing. I don't think that, that um, persecution is necessary, even if it's to be expected. And we do have persecution in other subtle ways, such as from the secular agenda, whether through scientists who are opposing anything that is um, anything that claims that there is a creator, and they say that the only truth is atheism, and if you don't have atheism, then you don't have truth. And so that's the way that they try to raise up the children in schools. Or whether it's uh, the other side, where you've got um, it's not it's not scientism. It's actually the the culture that the culture is saying that transgenderism and homosexuality and these other things are are not only acceptable but they're to be promoted and flaunted. And it, and if you have any kind of statement that would say I don't agree with that, then you are to be absolutely the enemy. But again, we don't have it where we're being slaughtered. Now. I want to stress again, though, that what we're facing today, yeah, it, it is a sort of persecution, and yes, there is persecution in, in other places of the world that is absolutely horrendous, and that's the wisdom of the world to persecute, but the tribulation that we have in mind, the 70th week of Daniel, it is something different. It is, it, it's not the same. Uh, the great tribulation is that last period just before Jesus returns. One of the things that makes it different. We have in Revelation chapter 12 a statement of Satan being cast down, that Michael and his angels fight against the devil and his, and his angels, and the devil is overpowered and hurled down to the earth. And woe to the earth because the devil knows he has a short time. That passage in Revelation chapter 12, when you go to it, and you read the whole context, there are end times things that are happening there. And later in this series, I do want to deal with Revelation 12, at least on a very surface issue, um, because there are so many things that go into it that's going to be beyond just a 101. But on a base level, just to kind of put it into perspective, I do want to go through it later. But know that the, the casting down of Satan, that is something that is at the very end, with the casting down of Satan, the Antichrist is established. That is the last three and a half years, which again, we're going to look into further through this study. Um, but essentially, essentially that, that's one of the big differences between now and then. While we do have persecution and tribulation now, the big difference is going to be at that point in time, Satan has been cast down and he knows that his time is very short and he's going to do everything in his power to be able to absolutely obliterate God's people. He wants to wipe them off the face of the earth. Now, with that being said, uh, to kind of define the difference a little bit, some say that the tribulation is the last seven years before Jesus returns. Some say it's only the last three and a half years. Personally, I think it's semantics. Um, personally, I think that uh, the difference is very minimal. Essentially, the difference is the that time of persecution. Is the time of persecution going to be seven years long, or is the time going to be three and a half years long? Well, we're going to get into kind of the next video or, or one of the following videos. That first half of the week, that, that, first, um, that first three and a half years, there is going to be some sort of a treaty made or some sort of a confirmation of a covenant is essentially the, the wording used in Daniel 9.27. That confirmation of the covenant, it is a, some sort of a peace, specifically in Israel, because you can read elsewhere in the book of Daniel where there are these wars that are taking place throughout the world. But some say because there's peace in, in Israel for that first three and a half years, the tribulation is only for the last three and a half years. I, I, don't, I don't know that it, that it really matters. I, like I said, I think it's semantics. I don't know that it really matters as to whether you call the tribulation that whole seven-year period or the last three and a half years. As long as we know what you're talking about, the word is just a word. So where does the idea of a seven-year tribulation come from? Well, let's go ahead and read. I've been talking about Daniel 9, there are these 70 weeks, these 77-year periods. 
He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, for one week. In the middle of the week, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, for those of you who haven't read the book of Daniel in a way where you can understand it, I would, I would emphasize and tell you, go back to the book of Daniel after watching this video and read chapters 2, 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12. See if you can't read it and come to a better understanding because ultimately I'm not going through the book of Daniel here. I'm just going through some of the biblical material which includes the book of Daniel. And in order to understand it, Daniel really is the framework. The, um, the four beasts of Daniel 7. You find this little horn that comes out of the fourth beast. This is the framework of Daniel 8 that has the ram and the goat, and there's a little horn that comes from one of the horns of the goat. The little horns are both the Antichrist figure in both chapter 7 and chapter 8. The he here in Daniel 9.27, this is also the Antichrist. So you have the little horn of Daniel 7 and 8, and the king of the north of chapters 11 and 12. Specifically, chapter 11, starting around verse 21 or so. Uh, and, and the reason I start there is because when you, when you trace the Hebrew antecedent, that, that subject from the last verse, if, if the he of the last verse where he sets up his royal tents is the Antichrist, and you trace that back, that subject begins in verse 21. So if we're talking about the same person through the whole segment of verses 21 through 45 in Daniel 11, then that whole segment is talking about the Antichrist. Uh, whereas the scholars who, who say that the Antichrist only starts uh, in subject in Daniel 11 with um, verse 40 or verse 35 or wherever they want to put it, I don't agree with that. So, um, <laughs> kind of a rant there. But um, the he that is going on here in Daniel, Daniel um, 9.27, this one who confirms the covenant, this is the Antichrist. Now you can see in the middle of the seven, so three and a half years in, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, what does that mean? If we, if we look at this 70th week and we say, well, that's a future tribulation. If we were to say that, how can he put an end to sacrifice and offering if there's currently no sacrifice and offering in Israel? This would emphasize that if, we go, if we're going to say that the, that the, um, if we're going to say that, that, the 70th week that the tribulation is future, then, we're, then we need to say that there's going to be a third temple in Jerusalem that sacrifice and offering will be uh, offered upon. The seven mentioned here is a seven-year period of time. Daniel is told of 77s. We've already gone through those. In verse 24, in Daniel 9.24, we find that the end of the 77s, the 70 weeks, is that God will finish transgression He'll put an end to sin. He'll atone for wickedness. He will bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and he will anoint the most holy place. So question, has that happened? Has God brought in everlasting righteousness? Has God put an end to wickedness, put an end to sin and, to and atoned for wickedness? Has he finished transgression? Has he sealed up vision and prophecy? Has he anointed the most holy place? Well, the answer is yes in some regards, but the answer is definitely no, especially this sealing up vision and prophecy. To, to, what is it that Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? He says that there will come a time when knowledge ceases and when prophecy and they all come to fullness. There will come a day and age when there is no more prophetic utterance. I mean, when we are, when we are in the millennial kingdom, you no longer are going to be wrestling with the scriptures and trying to figure out and piece together what's going to happen during the tribulation. After the tribulation has already occurred and Jesus has established his kingdom on the earth, we no longer have to ask the question of what is going to happen. We, we just have to look back and say, yeah, it happened exactly like the prophet said it would happen. So, I mean, in a sense, yeah, vision and prophecy has been sealed up, but in another sense, it has not. And in a sense, the most holy place has been anointed in that we've been uh, we've been offered access into the Holy of Holies through the blood of Christ and through that veil which is his body. This is the whole point of Hebrews. But in another sense, no, it hasn't happened. So, I mean, there's a technical yes, but there's also a definite no. 
The 70 weeks are broken into three parts. 70 se there's seven sevens, which is 49 years, to the rebuilding of the temple. And we find that from the declaration, whatever declaration we put that on, um, there's a book by uh, Robert Anderson, Sir Robert Anderson. It's called The Coming Prince. He does a masterful job, goes in a lot deeper than what I'm going to go in here. But he does a masterful job at pinpointing the times in history to say, this is the declaration being spoken of, what other declaration could it be? Uh, I know that scholars debate on this. I'm going to leave it kind of open. There's, but from the declaration, probably the declaration, declaration of King Cyrus, probably, uh, from the, the edict that goes forth, there's 49 years to the rebuilding of the temple. When you go from the rebuilding of the temple to whenever that, whatever, whenever, whenever, yeah. <laughs> Whenever the completion of that event took place, you can count 62 sevens, 434 years, until Jesus was crucified. Now that, that is a much more concrete fact. That is an event that we can, accept, that we can actually uh, trace out. That whenever the 49 years were completed, we know the date. Uh, be, we know the date because the Jews have recorded it and kept it as sacred for them. 434 years after that, Jesus is crucified. The anointed one was cut off, according to Daniel uh, 9.26. But then we have this last seven, this 70th year. Uh, this is split into two halves. And we read the verse. There's the first half where there's this confirmation of the covenant, and then there's this cutting off of the sacrifices and offerings, and then this abomination that causes desolation, but the end, at the end of the seven, uh, he who has done all of this, he's the one who's cut off. He's the one who is brought to an end. The last seven is speaking of a time where some wicked ruler will destroy the sanctuary and set up an abomination that causes desolation. Now, that should be something that, that goes ding, 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 ding in your head. You should hear that and think, oh wait, didn't Jesus say something about abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet? Why, yes he did. In Matthew 24, 15, we find Jesus actually referencing this event, which it's not just there in, in, in Daniel 9, uh, 27. We also find it in Daniel 11, 30, 30 or 31. Um, Daniel 11, 30, 31. When, when you go there, you see this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And Jesus says, look, when you see this happen, flee to the hills. What's he essentially getting at? Jesus is driving at, at the fact that in the future from Jesus, in the future from Jesus, there will be this abomination of desolation. Now, some, some Christian scholars have claimed that Daniel was fulfilled a couple centuries before Jesus with Antiochus Epiphanes. The problem is, if you take seriously Jesus' own words, he says there's this abomination of desolation that's to take place, and then flee to the hills. Run for your life, essentially. If we, if we take Jesus seriously, that it's a future event from Jesus' day, how can it be fulfilled two centuries before Jesus during the time of the Maccabees? How is that possible? It's not possible. So even though Antiochus Epiphanes, for the, again, for those of you who, who either have done some study or you start looking into this further and you start to find all of these other opinions, for those of you who come across this, while Antiochus Epiphanes might indeed have a lot of similarities to what's going on in Daniel chapter 11, he doesn't fulfill it to a T for one, and for two, uh, you can't say that it was fulfilled with Antiochus Epiphanes and then also claim that Jesus is making a reference back to Daniel and saying it's future. That's, it's impossible to, to do the text uh, justice in that way. So what future event, from the time of Jesus, of course, what future event fits the bill of what Jesus is saying and what Daniel is also saying? The closest event that we have would be the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. The problem, again, though, we have, we have people who would claim that this is indeed the event. And they would use this argument of saying, you cannot separate the 69th week from the 70th week. But yet, if we have the Messiah being cut off somewhere around 30 AD, how is it that we separate the 70th week from the other 69 weeks? We separate it by some 40 years. 
And these people, they're, they're called preterists. Uh, some, sometimes they'll even be called partial preterists or orthodox preterists. Look, the, these preterists, they, they, they do separate the, the 70th week from the 69th week. How do you separate the two weeks? Well, if, if these people are using that as their argument that you can't separate it, are separating it, why can't we separate it by 2,000 years? Why can't we say that the tribulation is still future? Because there are patterns in the Bible that while you have 70 weeks and then, uh, that while you have 69 weeks and the, and the Messiah is cut off and that's fulfilled with Jesus, why can we not say that there are patterns that, yeah, Antiochus, it's a pattern. He shows forth what Daniel was speaking. And so Daniel had immediate implication for that day and age. But then we go forward and we see Titus coming into Jerusalem and destroying Jerusalem. There was an immediate implication of Titus, uh, or of um, of Rome, I guess, with, with the death of Jesus. And they're looking for that, that coming time of tribulation. And that when the armies surrounded Jerusalem, there were people who took the words of Jesus seriously. And they did run to the hills and they found safety in the hills. It happened. I get it. But it wasn't the ultimate fulfillment. It wasn't like that... We can just take a check mark and say, done. There's still something we're looking for because, again, Titus does not fulfill the words of Daniel. The, the end of Titus was not by the, the rock that was cut out, but not by human hands, according to Daniel 2. The end of Titus was a natural death. It was not a supernatural death. And if we take the book of Daniel seriously, that with the coming of the, of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven is the end of that little horn, of the end of that in, uh, Antichrist figure. Where is the coming of the, of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven to kill Titus, to kill Antiochus? It didn't happen. Where is the coming of, the, uh, coming of Jesus with the brightness and splendor, as according to 2 uh, Thessalonians 2? Jesus didn't come with his brightness and splendor to destroy the Antichrist in AD 70. Again, Titus died of natural death. So, I mean, while we, while we can uh, see a pattern that is established here and say, yeah, there, there was, a, in a sense, a fulfillment here. There was a, a real legitimate, we can see how it happened, and we can say there are a lot of parallels there. We cannot say that that fits the bill 100% and that that is something that, check, it's off the list, it's been done, it's completed. No. So... <laughs> I feel like I'm stumbling over my words a little bit, but the point is this. The 70th week of Daniel, if we say that that's the tribulation, we can still say that it's the future because there are these things like, like Titus's death being natural. There are these things where it just doesn't ultimately bring all of the pieces of the puzzle together. And while in this video I'm struggling because I know that it's a 101, and for those of you who don't know a whole lot about the end time subject, and you're going through this and you're listening, you're probably kind of confused as to what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm bringing this up because we're going to continue, and if you go back through this and listen, you're going to think, oh, that's what he was talking about. Or later, as you're, as you're studying it on your own, you're going to come across these other ideas, and you're going to go, oh, I remember he said something about this, and yeah, no, I, I see what he's saying now. The event of De Daniel's 70th week must be future. That statement of conclusion in Daniel 9.24, it has not happened physically. And that was the whole context of Daniel 9, is that physically, the, the tabernacle, or the, um, the, the most holy place, physically would be anointed. Physically, transgression would end. Physically, wickedness would be put to an end. It would be cut off. It would be stopped. God is going to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. That's essentially what it comes down to. We have Hebrews beautifully pointing out that, that all of these things in Daniel 9.24, they, they do take root, and they are spiritually, uh, yes, it has happened. <laughs> um, but, but there's a physical expectancy that, that the author of Hebrews also admits to in Hebrews 9.28. Look, there's a salvation that has already come through Jesus, but we eagerly await for his second appearing apart from sin for salvation. So how is it that we have a salvation through Jesus already, but we're waiting for salvation? 
It's because there's both the spiritual and physical. Yet there has been that fulfillment, that end of that finishing of transgression, the end of sin, the atonement of wickedness, the the everlasting righteousness has been brought in. Yes. But we're waiting for a physical representation that it's not just it's not just for us who are um, in the new covenant and spiritually the the seed of Abraham. It's for when Jesus returns and all of the nations behold the glory of God. There's a there's a worldwide peace that the prophets speak of. It's consistent throughout the prophets, over and over and over again. And we've looked at this a little bit already. This final tribulation, it's the end of the nation's own agendas. Any nation that continues after this time must submit to the authority of God by entering the tents of Shem. And I, I give you a reference here. And the idea of that, entering the tents of Shem, what does that mean? It's what Isaiah would talk about, that they go up to Jerusalem. and they, Or it's what Zechariah talks about here with going up to Jerusalem and celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. It's what, it, it's what Isaiah 7.14 talks about with God being amongst us, being Emmanuel, God with us. That's the whole point of, of tabernacles, is that God has tabernacled with man. Now, we can celebrate that now, that God has tabernacled with men through, um, that there was a physical tabernacle that went through the wilderness with the tents of Israel. And that's what it's kind of looking back towards, is that God tabernacled with men. But then we have in the New Testament, Jesus came, and we have John using that same kind of ideology, that Jesus tabernacled among men. Jesus being God, God has tabernacled among men in the man Jesus. And so we can celebrate it now through that as well. But there's a future understanding to the Feast of Tabernacles, that God is going to literally set up his, his kingdom, and all nations are going to be a part of that. And any nation, by the way, Zechariah 14, if you go back and read it, any nation that does not submit to that authority and in entering into that tent, any nation that does not do that, honoring the Feast of the Tabernacles, they will have no reign. Essentially, God's like, look, if you're not going to abide by my rules at this point in time, then you're not going to be continuing as a nation any longer. I will cut you off from the face of the earth, essentially. The end of the tribulation is the stone cut out from a mountain, but not by human hands. I, I, I kind of referenced that earlier. And again, if you, if you don't know all of these references, I do, I appeal to you, go back to the book of Daniel and read it. Because that's what I'm speaking from mostly here. This stone cut out from a mountain, but not by human hands. This would be the, the Son of Man. We have Jesus referencing this in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him. This stone that was cut out of a mountain but not by human hands, it struck the statue in Daniel 2. And all of the, these elements of the statue, these, these five kingdoms that they represent, they crumble to the ground. And they're, they're blown away like, like the wind would blow away chaff. We have in Daniel 11.45, the Antichrist will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help. It's this idea. How does he come to his end? It's found in Revelation 19 with the coming of Jesus that Jesus comes and, and the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown uh, into the fire, alive into the fire. And you have the exact same statement being made in Daniel chapter 7 that with the Son of Man coming on the cloud... The little horn is thrown alive into the fire. It's the exact same statement. Everything about the end times revolves around this time, this 70th week, this tribulation period. Revelation, when you read the book of Revelation, you have to understand there's a seven-year period that is repeating over and over and over again. You have the seals. At the end of the seals comes the wrath of the Lamb, right? With that sixth seal... The sixth seal is broken and the wrath of the Lamb has come. And then you have this time where there's the 144,000. And there's this um, celebration of how salvation has come. Again, we have this, this language of tabernacles in Revelation chapter 7. So you have the first six seals, the wrath of the Lamb on the sixth seal. That seems to speak of the seven-year period and the coming of Jesus. Jesus being the Lamb. The, uh, Jesus coming in his wrath and destroying the Antichrist figure and, and all that 
that have aligned themselves to that Antichrist figure. And then you have tabernacles in, in Daniel chapter or in Revelation chapter seven. You have the um, the seven trumpets from Daniel. Or I keep saying Daniel. The seven trumpets from Revelation eight through uh, eleven. And again, you can trace it through. It seems to go through this this seven year period again. So you've got kind of the the six seals, the seven trumpets. They all line up kind of side by side here. You've got Revelation 12, 13, and 14 being another repetition of the same seven-year cycle. You have Revelation 16 being the seven bowls. This is another repetition of the same seven-year cycle. You have uh, Revelation 17, 18, and 19 being kind of that putting the final details together of the very end, the destruction of Babylon, Babylon being the kingdom of the Antichrist. You have all of this going through again and again and again. Revelation is cycling. It, the, the technical term is recapitulates. The, the final seven years is known as the time of Jacob's trouble. This, this term comes straight out of Jeremiah 30, verse 7. But if you ever read any other material, if you ever listen to other material, and you come across the time of Jacob's trouble, and you're asking, what the heck is that? It's that, it's that final, technically final three and a half years, but it's, it's that uh, 70th week of Daniel. It is that um, time of... Uh, persecution and great tribulation, uh, the time unlike any other that Jesus would speak of, that Daniel 12, 1 speaks of, that Jeremiah 30 also speaks of, a time unlike any other. Um, it is the time when the world and the nations are vehemently persecuting the people of God. We read of the 70th week as starting with peace, but in the middle of the week, desolation begins. I, and I think I'm repeating myself by that point. Uh, we can compare Daniel 2.34, Daniel 7.11, 8.25, 9.27, 11.21, 11.31, and 11.45. Uh, they all seem to describe the same character, the same uh, Antichrist figure. It all kind of brings the similar, these similar components together. And, and I'm going to read it in the next slide. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. This little horn of Daniel is later recognized as the vile prince and again as the king of the north. Often the prophets speak of an imminent destruction coming from the north. The north is where the sun doesn't shine and you plant your gardens on the south side of your property because that's where the sun is. Darkness is in the north and from the north comes this antichrist figure. That's how we get this king of the north. And again in Daniel 8 you have um, the northern territory of, of Greece. When, it, when Greece is split into four parts there's the north part and from the, from the north uh, you have that little horn emerging. So let's go ahead and read this um, straight out of Daniel. Again, go back and read the book of Daniel if, you, if you're not familiar with this. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then I continued to watch because the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. This little horn grew until it reached the hosts of heaven. It threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled them. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him and, and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. He will confirm a covenant with the many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person, a vile prince, if you will, who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. And by the way, um, he's not been given the honor of royalty here. If you, if you go to Revelation 13 and you start reading about this beast that comes from the sea, it makes a statement that this beast is given its throne and authority from the serpent. The serpent gives this beast the serpent's throne, the serpent's authority, the serpent's power. So this man who has not been given the honor of royalty, this antichrist figure, it plays right into the beast 
of this one that comes from the abyss of Revelation 11, the beast out of the sea from Revelation 13. Uh, in Revelation 17, this beast that the woman rides on that comes from the abyss, it's all describing the same person. It's this little horn of Daniel. It's this, it is this one who sets himself up against the prince of princes. It is the one that, that comes into Israel and comes in when the people feel secure. Do you understand what I'm getting at? It all ties together here. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas at the beautiful holy mountain. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Do you see how all of these verses are tying together? Uh, here's, the, here's the list again, if you want to write it down. These verses all speak of similar statements. If you want to know what does it look like in that last seven-year period, what is the Antichrist going to do? Where does he come from? The book of Daniel gives all of these details. The king of the north, well, he's part of the northern territory of Greece. So where does he come from exactly? Well, we don't know exactly, but we have a general idea. And and to think of like in Daniel 8, this horn, he he grows towards the the south, the east, and the whole and the beautiful land. This gives you an idea. Well, if he if he moves south, he has to be in the in the north part. If he moves east, he has to be in the western part. If he's moving towards the beautiful land, again, this gives you a description. Why is he moving towards the beautiful land? It is because he has rage against the covenant. That's the whole point. So I think with this, we're going to finish our video here. Um, I don't know that there's a whole lot I can I can put into this video, uh, more than what I've already put in. Um, there are details that all connect to this, and as you continue through this series, you're going to find that there's a lot of information that the Bible gives. It's solid information. It's not speculation. And it all just ties together. And so without the foundations, we can't understand what the rest is going through. But hopefully with this, you've got a, a general idea of what the 70th week looks like. And we're going to then now kind of break it into the pieces, kind of that beginning part, the middle part, and then the end part. And we're going to go through that and add a lot more details to each segment. And then from there, we're going to add more details to the whole picture. Uh, thanks for listening. And until next time, grace and peace to you in Christ.